If Dave, this is Dave. When I first heard it, I think it, it really stood out because I couldn't tell what kind of music it was necessarily. I couldn't tell if he was black or white as a singer either. We think it's maybe from the 70s or 80s or 90s, you can't really tell. I saw it was really cool. I actually thought the lyrics are really poetic. It feels like if you were walking around and it was like what would be in your head, but no one else can hear it. The sound of it, the, the groove of it, the lyrics, everything is kind of special. Like. It didn't sound like anything I knew. It made you kind of come up with stories in your head about what could the situation have been that made this music. To work with it took several years just to get in touch with him. When we realized that we wanted to get in touch with Doug, it took a couple of minutes. <laughs> So I heard Doug's music for the first time about two weeks ago, and I heard Gentle Persuasion and was like, oh my god, this is an amazing song that uh, it sounds very unlike anything that I'd heard before. Looking him up, I saw he's playing three shows and needed a band, and um, I, uh, you know, played, played drums, percussion, I played drums here and there um, for like 20 years, so I was like, I would love to play with this guy, I love his grooves. So within an hour of hearing Gentle Persuasion, I'd recorded, a, I'd recorded myself playing to it, talked to Eric, and Eric was like, we love what you're doing. We'd like, we'd like for you to be involved. At which point I learned that the band was going to consist of 13 and 14 year olds, which meant that they already had a drummer. I guess we try to create a show that is a show that we'd like to go to ourselves, whatever that means. Um, but we went back to this original idea that I'd had for him to perform for if he was ever going to perform live, and that was to have him play with like high school kids. So we got this great band in New York. Uh, they're called Clover and the Clockworks. Uh, they're between 12 and 14 years old, three girls and one boy. And they became like the core of the band. And then we, we started adding people on top of that. I played in bands periodically. Uh, I mean, I'm from like rural Alabama, and you know, I played with my friends in basements. But, uh, you know, um, I'd say professionally, I would say I have a very limited experience. Even Sunday, you Every day is a holiday. So, Doug, have you watched many of the submission videos that people send you? No. Nope. Doug doesn't nope. have a doesn't have a computer. Ah, uh, okay. So it's hard to get digital stuff to him. Why do you not have a computer, Doug? I'm computer illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> they, do, they came up with it after my time. <laughs> yeah. So you don't have an email address or anything? No.
everything is new and special for this gig. Like I've never played with kids. <laughs> I've never played with Doug or like a famous artist. So it's super exciting, of course. It was really nice to sing with him. Like we harmonized with him and it was the low part of the harmony. It was cool like to add on to it. This is like the toughest thing we've done. It's a lot of people, cameras, like we're here for five hours every, like for the last two days. I really like it because like there's so many new people and like you get to see all these people who have done so many things and like are really experienced and they do like really cool instruments and they can teach us things. Like when I signed up for this when I was like five or six, I didn't realize that I would come so far. It's like a milestone for me. The essence of the whole project is that you take it somewhere and then for every city you go to, it takes its own life and it's not just about recreating Doug's songs, it's like recreating it with the people that are there. My name is... Doug Greenblatt World Tour. Yeah. So we've been using these name tags. And do you write your name in it? Yeah, everyone writes their own name. So like everyone in the band will write opening night, which was kind of like an open rehearsal, we played in a park uh, outside in front of this record store called Command, the Lower East Side. So I think, Doug, I think we're setting up in the park here, man. Oh, we're setting up in LK? Yeah, we're going to do like a guerrilla performance, okay. like run the gear over, play in like 20 minutes, and then try to like, and then run it back before the police get called. <laughs> beautiful day for a guerrilla outdoor performance. Yeah, yeah, beautiful day for a guerrilla. <laughs> There's a brand new dance in the world today. We just move We were walking through the street and then I was trying to find the store. I've never been in the store before. So we went to the store and like, we were listening to music, it was like, this is him, like, singing. It was the live show there in the middle of the park, like with the kids playing, and like, Joachim was doing the keyboards, and like, Joachim, this is amazing. <laughs> like, this is something, it only happens in New York. There. That's the most important thing. Attracted some outside attention. I saw the parks department. Yeah, she had a badge, sheriff's badge. It was very official. I was starting to sweat a little bit, but she was uh, she was one of the good ones. That was my favorite part. Like that was <laughs> when she walked over, and I've never had that happen before. That was a new experience, and it was, it was good. I guess I'm just like a gangster. I didn't expect us to get closed down, but at least they let us do another song. So Doug, what did you say to the park ranger when she came up to you? You met Chance, honey. <laughs> <laughs> So, Doug, honored to be here with you, man. Uh, thank you, thank you. First of all, how did you come up with the name Doug Green Blunt? Thought I was feeding myself. Cream, Harim. I put just throw the H over the C. Come up with Harim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And is your last name Blunt? Yes. That's real. It's real. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> so you mentioned being involved in gang 
brawls and things. Were you were you in a gang in San Francisco? Yeah, I was. I was. Yeah. Being in a gang was was like um, is that actually is like growing up without a father, and so you join the gang. I figure you join a gang. Uh, you don't have a father figure in your life to pull you out to say no to you, and you would gang, join a gang. You said you had a stroke. How long ago was that? Oh, I think I was 57 when I had the stroke. Why you having it? It's a very strange, enlightening thing. It's like you die and you go over to the other side, and you hear people say, "Come back, come back, come back." You know, <laughs> like that. Did you have an experience like that where you felt you were on the Whoa, brink? No, it's like that all the time. It's still like that. You can still, it's still like being on the other side and people can come back, come back, come back, you know, still like that. <laughs> yeah, that's what's good about it, you know. He was driving, Doug was driving when he actually had the stroke. They said that he had six months to live and they sent him home in a wheelchair and said that he would never walk again. Well, I used to leave work every day at lunch to fix his lunch and everything like that because we had changed his diet for him to become like a vegetarian. And I got a physical therapist in there and a speech therapist and everything. I feel really good and it's been like well, almost 10 years. So the doctors aren't always right. But it's kind of sad the way it went because of our age difference and that he's sick now. That's why I'm glad that he's able to travel and he's able to do what he wants to do with his retirement. At least that. There's no little left for me. This show in LA came about. I've been posting a lot about Doug. I had all the Doug's kind of like social media stuff. And someone that kept kind of liking and commenting was Chris Manick, Peanut Butter Wolf of Stone's Hill Records. Uh, I told Doug, when you get to LA for this show, it's gonna be like, it's gonna be really great. <laughs> because Chris has put together such a great band. So Doug, do you know anything about the uh, the band you, you'll be playing with? No, I, I know nothing about them. I was surprised to see you. Yeah. <laughs> Blast from the past, man. Yeah, yeah. That great song with those, with your cog, with that, that bongo beat. Uh, I brought my bongos too, man. Yeah. I my camera and my bongos. All right. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. It's his record label. Ah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> all right, all right. Don't you sue me it. for bootlegging. I only made one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Good to meet you finally. Yeah, it's cool to meet you. Yeah, man. Come on in. Uh, okay. Doug, you guys? Hi. Hey. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Uh, this Hi. is Prophet. He's also from the Bay. Or was in the Bay uh, for a while. Yeah, a long time. Hey, yeah. Good right around. Right right oh, place. yeah. That's what I love at business. Okay. That's where I live at. Was it all with one keyboard, or was there, was there more than one? No, just one. It was all one person doing all that? Just, that was me on the guitar. No. There's yes. three layered synths on there. There has to be. There's it, there's it, yes. There's all these things now. footage existed when I saw that I was like I flipped out. It was just a perfect capturing of a moment that made you kind of come up with stories in your head about what could the situation have been that made this music. I asked him about the guitar solos because it's I've just been dying to know like what the process was. He's like is it were you into jazz? And he's like, yeah a little he's like mostly boxing. I'm like that makes so much sense, you know? It's like unpredictable combinations like 
body blow, body blow, uppercut, uppercut, huh, huh, you know, it's like that's, it's kind of a genius, you know, I don't know anyone who plays guitar like that, he's just, he's in his own time zone. <laughs> When you have a stroke or something like that, you can look at it as bad or you can look at it as good. I chose to look at it, just look at it as good. Everything, man. I saw all the beauty in it, you know. Wow. Yeah. My whole right side was found like. Yeah. <laughs> it was I mean, dumb, wasn't it? It works out. You know, I can't play guitar and I can't play guitar. That's what really uh, makes it really bad. I can't play the guitar. Yeah. 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 Hello everybody, thanks so much for coming out. This show is the first ever show for Dr. Green Black in Los Angeles. And it's really heartwarming for me, but I've been working with Doug now for a couple of years, to see him come to a city like this. And there's people that give him the love and appreciation like this band has. So give it up to them. The LA Green Team. Fan. It's awesome. It's like psychedelic and funky at the same time. Whimsical, all the bubbles, the crazy musicians, all the energy. I just felt alive. To see all of these people who I know love the music so much all coming together to be a backing band for this person that I love, it just like fills me with so much joy and hope for music and art in general. It's amazing because I know people who are young and 
they're like, oh, I'm too old to do music. To see someone actually do this at Doug's age, after what he's been through, and Doug helps me believe in myself. He's so supportive after everything. He's like, you're doing great, you're doing awesome, you got it, you're the Caribbean queen. After the show, I got to wondering, the fact that Doug's such a low-key guy who keeps so much information to himself. For example, when exactly he started playing music, the year Gentle Persuasion was recorded, details about his performances in the hospital. I found myself wondering at times how true these stories were. I ended up in Sonoma for my wife's birthday and called Doug, who invited me down to San Francisco where he's lived the last 60 years. I wanted to explore the world he inhabited in the 80s see the hospital where he played for his patients, and meet his teacher, Victor, who Doug credits with teaching him everything he knows about music, and providing the band of adult students who played on Gentle Persuasion. Hi! You behaving yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> She's in out of trouble. <laughs> so Doug, we're watching like um, some of the stuff from the, from the website and these little snippets. Oh, and yeah. And then we're on TV, I'm going, where did I get that gold thing? I'm like, what am I wearing? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know it was a long yeah. time ago because Victor's hair was dark. Yeah. Well, we can go into the uh, studio if you like. Where? Go right next door. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. I graduated um, in 81 uh, from San Francisco State University with a degree in music and percussion. And at that point, I started doing some teaching. Eventually, we kind of came up with this idea of having a, um, a class where musicians could get together and sort of learn how to be in a band. Well, no high school students showed up, but adults did. And one of the first people that signed up was Doug. Nothing's real, Maria. You must have told the truth. One of the reasons we did create the studio is to give other people an opportunity that we've always had. You know, we've always had a wonderful opportunity to, to record, to perform. We're still, you know, performing musicians. It's pretty amazing that uh, the journey, the journey from where we started uh, with Doug working and uh, now that it's, uh, you know, it's really going worldwide and he's g getting uh, other people an opportunity to hear his music. I think that's great. Yeah. yeah. And it's Doug. That's the best part. It's like, you know, I remember Doug. You know, I know him. Yeah, you know. <laughs> the guy with a smile on his face with a great laugh. It's Doug and he's writing these songs and now people are, are hearing him. That's pretty cool. When I first heard of Doug playing music, more was kind of like a jazz, soft rock, wasn't a hard rock. The effect that it had, it brought on healing as almost doing therapy. His caring and compassion for the patients go hand in hand with music because our patients are one of a kind. They come from the streets, they are neglected and rejected by their families and friends because they have HIV. Some of them have already given up on life. So as nurses and staff, especially CNAs who work hand in hand with the patients, you really have to have that music, that love for your patients. And that's what Doug had already exhibited for us. We had 30 beds on the floor and it's like straight down. It was just, you just walk straight down on the floor and there was like beds on the side. I'd have my guitar in my hand and I'd walk down and sing to him. After I finish the song, I'd move on. Were people smiling and reacting when you were singing? Yeah, Sometimes. Not, not very much. It, it made them feel happy. A lot of the patients with head injuries, something about music brings them, you know, alert, some cry. Some of them would try to dance even if they can't really get up and walk. 
<laughs> so we have to be there all the time, <laughs> making sure they don't fall. <laughs> Doug would be here in the evening. We had one resident that I can remember even would want to get dressed as a coming to the concert. So it took away that spirit of the cast out or, you know, but I am important. I'm getting dressed for this concert that I will participate in. And that's based on the music that he played, but also the spirit of which he played the music. Music sounded like it's lifting your soul out from being lonely, like it's holding you up. I was just talking to him, asking people about him the other day, you know, what happened to him. So I was just really shocked to see how he recovered from his stroke, you know, it was just really a nice recovery. Is it sounding good? The people like it, you know, it's... Did you bring no music today? I know, that's why. <laughs> You always supposed to say that. <laughs> 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 you always supposed to say that. <laughs> uh, huh? Oh, no, no. She, she never says anything about it. She doesn't? No. No, why do people like me? She doesn't yeah. like she, doesn't right. she don't say anything about it? Does she travel with you? Uh, no, it's a, it's a, I get a uh, mixed crowd. Oh, very good. Yeah, mixed crowd. More it's a mixed of... crowd. They got the money. Oh, great. Okay, you know, that's what I'm doing. That's what you're you, you, you're in London. You, you, when I was in Russia, I was practically all those there. Right. Yeah. All right. Man. You're London. Enjoying life. Yeah. That's good. I'm that's proud good. of you. Oh, man. True. To tell you the truth, secretly, I had a crush on Doug. And what he do? He went the other way and got married. I ain't going to say nothing. I'll get back on track. I wish I knew beforehand you were coming. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why you? You would change something? <laughs> you have something for me? <laughs> Doug, you're too much. <laughs> Good luck, Mr. Doug. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> A few months later, Doug was asked to play a festival in Tasmania, and he and the label invited me to join him. As a kid from Alabama, I hadn't even been to Europe, let alone an island halfway around the world. We were excited, and the energy was super high the entire 26-hour trip there. When we arrived in Hobart for Dark Mofo Festival, we were taken aback by the old-world colonial charm of the city. We met up with Dan Luscombe, who was in a popular band from Melbourne called The Drones, and went to the first rehearsal. Dan and... Doug, talk and chat, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you about your guitar sounds because I've been reading things in, um, in certain reviews of, particularly of General Persuasion, and, but, but, but of, the, of the album as a whole where people refer to flutes and they refer to uh, Caribbean drums and they say all these things, but it's your guitar, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> it's a guitar. Yeah. It has three, it had three sounds on, and they'd all be placed on my first three strings of my guitar. Yeah. And so I just, I just strum the guitar. Only on the first three strings? Only on the first three strings going up. So there was an effect on just those three strings? Just those. How'd you do strings. that? So it was coming out of the guitar? Yes. Like the lead going right? Yes. The effects were in the guitar? Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of that kind of thing. But I love reading these reviews where people say, yeah. oh, you know, it's great. It's got steel drums. <laughs> it's got flute. And it's like, no, oh, this is, really? that's, that's Doug. Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I was playing guitar, if I couldn't get a sound close to Jimmy's, I wouldn't, it, it would just... Freak me out you now, all yeah, the time. I think we Freak all feel like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm constantly disappointed that I don't see yes, like yes, you. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But yes. I'm going to keep trying.
show of the tour, we reunited with Clover and the Clockworks for Doug's first New York performance in a proper venue, Baby's All Right in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. As showtime approached, we were amazed to see that, despite the rain, there was a line around the block. The kids were stoked. Thank you. 
<laughs> For these kids, it's their first real show, like a sold out venue, and like, it's crazy. I can't imagine if it happened to me, like, yeah. You get a lot of like energy and like enthusiasm and, and happiness just through them, you know, like they're channeling so much energy. So you just take a little bit. Anytime you work with kids, it always teaches you a new way to think, a new way to approach the music, a new way to like, you know, funk it up. So I think that's that's what I'm gonna take from this. It's new ways to funk it up. This is a paycheck store. Dun, 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 this is a paycheck. Dun, 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 dun. Jude, you just finished the show. How are you feeling? Ecstatic. What was it like? Sweaty. It was fun. It was exciting. There were so many people. I loved it. It was so much fun. I thought I was so scared, but now I'm so happy. What are you holding? My first paycheck. After the final show, we said goodbye, and I was left with just the memories. One of the most vivid was the siren song in Tasmania that began and ended each day with 450 speakers in Hobart, broadcasting a vocal soundscape that was eerie, dark, and absolutely beautiful. As Doug and I sat together listening, I couldn't help but think about how a kid from rural Alabama ended up with a male nurse from San Francisco, traveling halfway around the world, becoming close friends, and experiencing what was for us a world tour. I thought of all the people we'd met, both heroes of ours, and those for whom Doug was a hero, and how the warmth, humor, and humility of Doug brought us all together. I just really try to take in his approach to life as much as possible. It could be small things like you have a bad day and you, you just give him a call and you, you cheer up and it kind of changes your perspective of whatever it was that happened. You know, I remember just him talking about his past and all the things that's happened in his past and how easily it just could have gone such a different direction for him. You know, growing up without a father, his mom raising 10 kids, growing up in the projects and all these things. But he's still so positive about life and how his life is, has gone. So I try to keep that in mind when shit hits the fan, <laughs> you know. Anybody else who's been through what he's been through, medical issues and stuff, would either feel sorry for themselves, other people would just, uh, and not Doug. He said, okay, well, you know, I have this challenge and I'm gonna meet it. But then along in the middle there, he started playing trumpet. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, okay, well, I can't, you know, the guitar's not working, okay, I'm working on trumpet. wanted music to be a gift that he could give back to people that truly appreciated it and also that filled his soul and I think the karmic impact of just him making all these good decisions has just given him his beautiful laugh and like it's given him this really great way of, of being able to live his life and still play his music and not have to think about all the things that we can worry about, like, am I too old for this? All those questions go out the window. Can I have a band of 14-year-olds who are just super excited and, and like, are as naive as it gets, but in all the right ways? Like, the answer is yes, and it always was yes, but it takes people like Doug to sort of make you see. But music is, is free, you know? It's not about the business, you know? And, like, I think from years of being in the business, I've blindsided myself, I think, to a lot of the purity of it. And uh, it, it's good to be reminded of that, you know. 
At this point in his life, anything that he does is supposed to be like, um, to kind of say like, oh, you gotta be proud of that. In 2008, they said that he had six months to live and said that he would never walk again. So anything that he does, it's like a, a, a feat, you know, we're defeating something. It's like having a dream when you're a kid, you know, and you dream something. The dream is coming true, you know. That's, that's, that's my friend.